This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Hey there! It's almost Christmas, so it's time for some Christmas lights... ...ning round. I deserve that. And because it's the sixth day of Christmas, I've got six geese a laying. Meaning... six questions to answer. Because geese are inquisitive and, and questions are like... eggs... Nothing about this analogy works. I'm not even sure it is the sixth day. When are you supposed to start counting? Yeah, apparently all the different gifts in that song represent different things. And according to my wife, the partridge in a pear tree means that there's uh, you're committing adultery for some reason. I don't know why. It's very weird. I'm pretty sure the Victorians came up with it. It's probably just hallucinations from arsenic and lead poisoning washed down with cocaine wine. Anyway, enough of all that. We got some questions. Let's get to the questions. Like always, these lightning round questions are gathered from Patreon supporters who are supporting at the solar system level or above. So I want to thank those people for the questions as well as their support. By the way, I just have to address this real quick. Every single video that I put out, I get some version of this in the comments. Hold on, how is this video posted 15 minutes ago and some of these comments say two days ago? I know the time zones are different, but what is happening? Why are there comments from two days ago if the video was released 10 seconds ago? Yes, those are Patreon supporters and channel members. They get early access to videos, usually a day or two ahead of everybody else. Which is something that I say at the end of literally every single video. And yet I still get that comment in literally every single video. I'm okay. So if you want to help to really confuse all the people that never watched at the end of the videos, you can sign up by clicking the join button below or going to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. It's a lot of fun. Robin Tennant Colburn asked, Do cell phones really interfere with commercial airplane cockpit equipment? Seems pretty hard to believe they don't confiscate phones if it's true, or wouldn't a lot of planes have gone down? Uh, that's a good question. I think this just falls under the umbrella of an abundance of caution. According to pilot and author of Cockpit Confidential, Patrick Smith, quote, can cellular communications really disrupt cockpit equipment? The answer is potentially yes, but in all likelihood, no. Even if it's not actively engaged with the call, a powered phone dispatches bursts of energy that can, in theory, interfere with the plane's electronics. Aircraft are designed and shielded with this interference in mind, however, and this should mitigate any ill effects. This so airplane mode is really just an extra layer of protection when the plane is in the air, but it's really at takeoff and landing when most accidents occur. This is when it's most important for pilots to be able to, you know, effectively communicate with the tower. And this is also kind of the only part of the trip where the pilots actually do anything. The rest of the time, the plane's being flown by autopilot and they're just kind of like monitoring to make sure everything's going right. Yeah, it's kind of the same reason that they want you to put away any large electronic devices during takeoff and landing. It's not so much that they're going to interfere with electronic anything. It's just that it's a big, heavy hunk of metal. And if something should go wrong or get bumpy, you don't want that flying around and smacking you in the face. I mean, I for one don't care. It's a minor inconvenience. It's a small price to pay for the fact that, uh, you know, because of this overabundance of caution that we're going through in all kinds of different ways when it comes to planes, planes almost never go down anymore. Commercial planes, anyway. So, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, flying is a modern miracle. Smartphones, a modern miracle. We don't have to have all of our miracles at once, do we? I also read something about how um, apparently like when you're using your cell phone on the ground, it will connect to one tower at a time. But if you're, you know, way up in the air, it'll connect with multiple towers at once. And this can actually put a strain on the, the wireless grid and cause problems uh, for telecommunications companies that way. So that's, that's kind of another reason to do it. Cole Parker asked, while one might debate the when, the if of self-driving cars seems settled. When level four unoccupied driving becomes available, what businesses and service types will be most affected? Taxis seem obvious, but what about parking lots or gas stations? The gas stations question is interesting because as autonomous cars take over and um, I'm assuming a lot of those are gonna be mostly electric. So gas stations in general are gonna be shifting and changing because of electrification, maybe more so than autonomy because even autonomous cars are gonna need gas. Assuming they're not electric. But what even is a gas station anymore? I mean, they're, they're mostly just convenience stores now with gas pumps on the outside that you can fill up with. And one of the arguments that I read when looking through this was that convenience stores might actually see a little bit of a boon because more people might be traveling uh, in cars than on planes because you can, you know, just kind of not have to drive. You can sit there and just do your stuff in your car. So convenience stores and restaurants and stuff might actually get a little bit of a, a pick, pickup because uh, people are gonna be in their cars more. 
The other argument might be that if um, we're all traveling through fleets of autonomous cars, uh, all of the places where they're going to be refueling wouldn't be, you know, on the street corners like you see gas stations now. They would be at these central hubs where all those autonomous cars are kept. Insurance companies are going to be heavily impacted by autonomous cars because, um, you know, as autonomous cars get safer and fewer accidents, then premiums will go down and uh, they'll actually make less money then. Then you have the trucking and logistics uh, sectors of the economy. Um, if it gets cheaper to move things around over trucking, um, that might lower the cost of products, or at least it should. It would obviously be very disruptive to ride-sharing companies, um, although Uber and Lyft are all trying to get their own autonomous thing going on, but for the actual specific drivers, yeah, that would, that would probably reduce the amount of rides that they would be able to do. Now you mentioned the parking lot thing. Yeah, one of the expectations is that as fewer parking lots are needed, then it would kind of shake up some real estate space. So there might be more room for, uh, for buildings or parks or something like that. Another random one might be streaming services like Netflix. We'll actually see a bit of a boon because um, as people are gonna be sitting around in their cars and they can watch streaming services while the car drives them around, we're gonna see a lot more consumption of that kind of thing. Driving schools will obviously become obsolete. And it's thought that this could accelerate the growth of e-commerce and restaurant delivery services. The entire world going to autonomous cars, first of all, it's, it's pretty far in the future before something like that could happen. But I mean, I, I think it's pretty safe to say it's going to affect everybody on some level, in all industries on some level. But those might be the first ones that come to mind. Brian Beswick asks, can you talk about the great arc? Is the cosmological principle dead? Okay, this was interesting. I, I was not aware of this one, so thanks for asking this. I really went down a rabbit hole here. So the giant arc was discovered with the help of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, so let's just start with that real quick. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, is a 2.5 meter wide optical telescope that conducts multispectral imaging and redshift surveying, and it's based out of the Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. It's been through a lot of iterations over the years, but it first got started in 1999, and its job is to survey as much of the sky as possible. You know, like most telescopes zoom in on a tiny point in the sky or on a specific star or something like that. Like you can think of the, the Hubble ultra deep field that focused on a tiny, tiny patch of sky that didn't seem to have anything in it. And then it turns out there were tens of thousands of galaxies. This is the opposite of that. This telescope wants to capture as much of the night sky as possible every single night and just chug away and just collect massive amounts of data. Apparently it collects 200 gigabytes of data every single night. Anyway, all of this data is available for astronomers and cosmologists to use and cosmologist Alexia Lopez claims to have found the biggest structure in the known universe. It looks like this, and they're calling it the Great Arc. So just to explain what you're looking at here, all the little blue dots in the background, those are quasars, basically primordial black holes, which I've talked about in a previous video, but they're super old and therefore really, really far away. And the gray blobs in front, those are galaxy clusters in between the quasars and us. And what Lopez and her team were looking for were specific signatures of light coming off of those quasars that could indicate the light was passing through matter. In this case, they were looking at magnesium. In other words, magnesium atoms in the galaxy clusters were absorbing specific frequencies of light or electromagnetic radiation. Now, we can't see these galaxy clusters, but the magnesium in the stars and dust clouds were absorbing that particular frequency of light in those spots, and so that's how you know there's something there. And this something, this massive supercluster of galaxies, um, stretches over 1 15th the length of the entire observable universe. And what they said was that it's 20 times wider than the moon in the sky. Which, you know, might not sound like much, but that's 9.2 billion light years away. So that, that's huge. Now, Brian, in his question, he also mentioned the cosmological principle, and this is where things get interesting. So the cosmological principle is the idea that the universe is homogeneous in the big picture view, that if you look around the universe, things should be distributed fairly evenly. And this is why things like the boat is void is so weird. So if this is an actual structure, it kind of breaks that hypothesis apart. So the big question becomes, is this really one giant structure that we're seeing here, or is it just a random collection of galaxy clusters that just happen to kind of fall into this pattern because we are pattern seekers, so that's what we look for. But there are some other big structures that have been found and theorized recently too. One is called the Sloan Great Wall, uh, one is called the Giant Gamma Ray Burst Ring, and the Huge Large Quasar Group. <laughs> huge Large. I know it's large, but how large is it? Is it like small large? No, it's huge large. Maybe I can do a video on the largest structures in the universe? Just saying. But yeah, because there are these theorized massive objects in the universe, it does kind of go against the cosmological principles. So it, it's, it's kind of teetering on the edge of being disrupted, but uh, we're not quite there yet. But that was super interesting. Thanks for the question.
Matt Herring said, question, what technology are you most excited for and why? For me, it's mRNA, if for no other reason than potential cancer vaccines. Okay, first of all, guys, Matt Herring is literally one of the very first people that started supporting me on Patreon like five years ago, and he's still on there going strong, blows my mind, total legend. But yeah, when it comes to your question, I gotta be honest, the mRNA thing is pretty far up there for me too. I, I just, I spend so much time and mental energy worrying about things like cancer, you know, especially the kind of cancers like, uh, you know, like pancreatic cancer, the kind that by the time you know you have it, it's too late kind of thing. I actually lost an uncle to that a couple of years ago. I mean, he, he was like, he was fine. And then he got diagnosed with it. And six weeks later, he was gone. It's just, ugh. So yeah, I mean, anything that could help relieve or take away that always there anxiety that I and I'm sure many people have about things like cancer would be a huge deal. I mean, just for mental health reasons, if nothing else. I actually went to a conference on aging and longevity recently, and there were all these speakers that were talking about different ways to increase lifespan and health span. Some of them were talking about stem cell therapies. Some were talking about other ways to reverse aging, which appeals to me for some reason. I'm old. I'm getting old. And there was another speaker there, this guy named James Malt, who is actually one of the designers of the biometrics stuff on the Apple Watch. And um, he created this new thing. I got a little sample of it here. It's called the Bio Button. And the idea is it's a little button. I'll open it up here. <clears throat> it's a little button that you stick on your body, on your chest or wherever. There we go. And uh, it measures your vital signs. It'll like take measurements. I think it measures, what is it? Like every, like every five, every second or something like that. Right now what they're using it for is it's supposed to basically like take the place of all the instruments that you get put on you at the hospital, right? Like all of that is supposed to fit on this one little button that you put on. So instead of sitting around the hospital where a lot of, you know, people with diseases are there and that's where a lot of infections get spread and stuff, um, you know, once you've had whatever procedure done that you need, you just put one of these on, go home, and then the hospital can basically just monitor you from where they are. He was talking about how they have what they call care traffic control. Like instead of air traffic control, it's care traffic control. So like one nurse can literally monitor about a hundred people that are at their homes and they've got these little buttons and if anything looks out of whack, then it'll automatically, you know, alert the nurse and they can take whatever steps they need from there. But this is like the first step where we can have uh, biometric sensors on our, on our bodies that might even be, you know, something in a watch format or something like that, that will continuously monitor our, our vitals and our, our, our bodies so that it can find problems before they get big. You know, we talked about how we don't really have health care we have sick care. You know, we wait until something goes wrong and then we go to the doctor and we try to fix it. Whereas with anything else, any other kind of machine that we deal with in our lives, it's something that we maintain. It's something that we regularly update uh, to prevent those problems from happening in the first place. But for some reason on our own bodies, we don't do that. So this is kind of like the blinking light on the dashboard in your car that shows up and lets you know that there's something wrong before everything falls apart. So I don't know. I mean, I, what he said made a lot of sense to me. And I think that we might be on the brink of having some, some wearable devices like this that can uh, you know, be a real game changer. Other things I find exciting are energy breakthroughs, you know, um, I think China just launched the thorium reactor. I've talked about those. Small modular reactors are exciting to me. And yeah, to me, electric cars and battery storage, energy storage options, that's all part of it as well. So th those are exciting to me. And I've been dipping my toe into VR stuff lately, and that's I'm starting to see the potential of that. And now we're talking about the metaverse and stuff. I'm gonna have to cover that at some point. But uh, the idea that if somebody really cracked smart glasses, I know that a lot of companies are working on it. I know Apple's working on it, but if somebody really cracked VR and AR smart glasses, I think, I think that would be really a game changer. I mean, and then there's JWST. My butthole is gonna be clenched really tight for the next six months on that. So yeah, there's, there's some exciting stuff on the way. And those are just a few that I thought of off the top of my head. If there's something I missed, something you guys are excited about, of course, I'm talking about it down below. And now a less inspiring topic. Colton Moss asked, what do you think the next 10 years will look like geopolitically? Colton went on to talk about China and Russia and how uh, they're being very aggressive on a global scale right now. The fact that Russia just amassed what, like 90,000 troops on the Ukraine border, not encouraging. So like, I am not remotely qualified to talk about these kinds of things. So uh, I'll just keep this brief, but I have a couple of thoughts. So we've been seeing a rise in authoritarianism lately over the last few, you know, several years. And I, I know it's a simplistic answer, but I still think that it has to do with the internet. The internet is still very new in a historical perspective and web 2.0, the social media landscape that we live in, that's just over what, 10 years old or something like that. Um, 
And I still think that we are a tribal species that's trying to navigate being a global species, and that's causing a lot of uprest and, uh, and chaos. I didn't know if I was gonna say upheaval or unrest, so I said uprest, which is not a word. Let's go with upheaval. Anyway, in times of chaos and upheaval, people tend to gravitate towards strong men and cults of personality, and I think that's why we're seeing some of that right now. I really hope that the next generation that's coming up will be a lot more savvy about that because they were born and raised in the internet and understand it a little bit better. And I think there's reasons to believe that that might be the case. Plus there are always pendulum swings. There's gonna be anti-authoritarian movements that spring up in response to what's going on here. Whether or not that will start to take effect in the next 10 years or so is a good question. So yeah, these authoritarians are gonna try to grab as much as they can as fast as they can before that pendulum swings back the other way. And uh, a lot of these places are gonna be trying to tear the United States apart using social media and whatnot because we've kind of been the world police for a while now. So yeah, I don't wanna be a total downer, but I do think that we've got some difficult times ahead. I don't think that the worst is behind us yet. Um, but that's just the opinion of one non-expert, so take that as you will. John Regal asked, if you could go back five years but only had enough energy in the time portal machine to shout a single statement at yourself through the time tunnel, what would you say? I love the thought put into that question. <laughs> You know what, honestly, I would just yell at myself, keep making videos, it works out. Now, five years was a really interesting time for me because um, I had just been doing the channel regularly for about two years at that point. I had just over 10,000 subscribers and I had just been picked to go to the Next Up program, the YouTube Next Up program in New York. So yeah, I mean, I wasn't making enough to completely do it full time yet. Uh, so I took another job where I was actually managing YouTube channels for, for brands and stuff, but it was a huge pay cut. Um, it was really difficult for a while there. I think everybody around me thought that I lost my mind. I couldn't even disagree with them. And then actually six months later, after I left that job, um, my entire department had gotten canned. So that, that was one of a few like extremely lucky breaks that I got. So yeah, but I, I kept with it. Things started to grow and snowball and you know, there were some difficult times there for a little while, but you know, here we are now and, and things are good. And, and it's funny that you picked that five years ago metric because uh, those were really um, stressful times. <laughs> I just made a huge personal leap and uh, I didn't know how it would work out. And there was, there was a lot of stress. There was a lot of stress. And if I had been able to talk back to myself and let myself know that things were gonna work out, I think that would have been a lot easier. But, I mean, if I knew, would I have worked as hard? You know, would the butterfly effect have kicked in? Would I have screwed myself? Those are big questions, I don't know. And Joan also asked one other question that um, I wanted to respond to, so let me just read this real quick. He said, have you ever noticed that dogs train us to a lesser degree? About a year ago, my dog began walking out to my wife and I and stretching. We always found it so cute that we'd scratch his sides. It took us about a month to realize that he was shaping our behavior as well. Is this owner bias or has he modified our behavior with positive reinforcement? So um, I, I experienced something very similar with, uh, with my dog, Jake, who we lost earlier this year. But yeah, when he was younger, um, I think maybe he, well, we thought he had some hip problems or something because he would just start limping kind of at random. And of course, whenever he was limping, we would go over and we would just, you know, coo all over him and like, oh, you poor baby. And we would love on him and everything. But yeah, we were kind of worried that he had some, some knee or hip problem that was causing that. Well, anyway, one day I come home from work and I walk in the back door and I'm standing there in the kitchen and he's limping over at me, you know, and I, and I lean down, oh, poor guy. And I look up and my wife is standing across the room and she's just like, and I was like, what? And she said, he was perfectly fine until you walked through that door. So yeah, he figured out that if he limped around and acted pathetic that we would love on him and pay attention to him. So he would do it more and more, you know, dogs, dogs know how to manipulate us. My, my current dogs do it as well. You and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. So anyway, thanks to all you guys for the questions. If there's anything, if you're watching this and there's a topic that you wanna see a full video on, let me know. It could happen. It would, of course, take some time to get those videos turned out. So in the meantime, maybe you could go check out today's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is, of course, the one streaming service that offers the best documentary and educational programming in the known universe. With thousands of tiles to choose from, from history to futurism, science to art, whatever you're interested in, you can find it there. And by the way, it's not all just space and nerd stuff. I actually just found out they have Winnebago Man. 
on Curiosity Stream. This is actually one of my favorite documentaries ever. Do you remember that viral video in the early days of the internet where there was that guy who um, was trying to sell Winnebago's or he was doing a video, uh, an informational video about Winnebago's and he was just so angry and he's dropping F-bombs left and right. I think the video title was called The Angriest Man in the World. I developed a multifunctional bathroom. Privacy, I don't even know what the f I'm reading. Oh, f Oh, don't slam the door. Anyway, somebody made a documentary about that guy and it is awesome. Yes, he's really that angry and yes, he's really that entertaining and uh, I was super excited to see it on Curiosity Stream. So lots to choose from there. Curiosity Stream will quickly become your favorite streaming service and even better, it comes with what might be your second favorite streaming service, Nebula. Nebula is a streaming service created by some of your favorite YouTubers, including yours truly, where we can feel free to experiment and try new things without the dreaded algorithm hanging over our heads. That includes my series Mysteries of the Human Body, as well as Real Engineering, Windover Productions, Legal Eagle, Lindsay Ellis, Minute Body, the list goes on and on. And you can see all my content ad-free, meaning that if you were watching it on Nebula right now, you wouldn't be seeing this part. Uh, and this also extends to my new podcast, Conversations with Joe. If you listen to that on Nebula, um, you get that without any ads, including the one that just dropped today, Drum Roll Please, where I interview Neil deGrasse Tyson. Among other things, he tells me how uh, I Dream of Genie sort of got his career started, in a way. I think it's an exclusive. He said he's never told anybody that before. Okay, and here's the crazy thing. So usually you get 26% off when you go to curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, but for the holidays, and this only goes until the 24th, so it's just this week, so you gotta hurry on this, uh, they are offering not 26% off, 42% off, meaning you will get both Nebula and CuriosityStream for a whole year for $11.59. I mean, just watching Winnebago Man alone is worth the price of admission for $11.59. So yeah, if you've ever been on the fence about signing up for Curiosity Stream, definitely take advantage of this. I've never seen it this cheap before. So anyway, curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, go check it out and get started streaming smarter stuff today. Link down in the description. All right, big thanks to Curiosity Stream for supporting this video. And again, a big shout out to the answer files on Patreon uh, who submitted the questions for today and are also just forming an awesome community. Um, I'm kind of recording this early, so I will get to the shout outs on Patreon at the beginning of the year. So if you've signed up and you're waiting, just hang tight, I'll get to you, I promise. But before I check out, if I may, I would like to extend a Merry Christmas for those of you who celebrate Christmas. And if you don't, a happy holidays. Um, I wish the best for all of you. It has been an amazing gift to be able to do this, uh, this channel for you guys, and I appreciate all the support that you give. So uh, go out there and have a great one. And I think that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, a happy holidays, whatever it is you celebrate, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.